On today's show, we're talking genre-specific writing groups, the bomb or not. So stay tuned. Hi, and welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie writers on their journey to publication. I'm Jamie Hirschberger. I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. I'm Christina Katane, and I write Christian dystopian fiction. Welcome back. It's been a whole week since we were together on the podcast and together with our friends in the chat. Hi, Piper and Gigi and Shell. Teresa says, I'm here. I'm here. She's had a little writing hiatus and she's happy to be back in the saddle. Hello, Liz. Um, hi to everybody also who is not able to join us for our live broadcast, which happens every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. So if you are ever available, we'd love to have you join us in the chat. It's a wonderful group of supportive ladies who are there every week with us, and we really appreciate them. And we appreciate you, listener, whatever platform you're listening on. If you happen to go to our YouTube page and can like and subscribe, we'd really appreciate it. Help other people learn about the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. So um, without further ado, let's launch into our typical format, which is the what's up. It's where we go around the virtual table and talk to our hosts about what's up. What's up with you, Tina Katane? Well, I was trying to remember this morning if I had ever told you guys on the podcast how my daughter decided on the baby's name. And um, Teresa has uh, assured me that I had not said it on the podcast because she just binge watched us all the way from before it happened. So <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> Yay, <confident. Teresa. laughs> thank you, Teresa. So what happened was my son-in-law kept coming up with these crazy names. He, if it was a boy, he wanted it to be Tiberius because Tiberius is Captain Kirk's middle name. Oh, like, I was, love I that. It was a Bible name. <laughs> I would be such no, a fan of it that. It also happens to be the Roman emperor that was in charge when Jesus was crucified. Well, that is probably oh, I mean, why I knew the name. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I mean, so, you want to get nitpicky. <laughs> but every name that and my daughter, Amber, came up with, he just put the cable. No, I dated a girl with that name or... No, I know a guy, and he was not nice. Like, okay, let's be honest. He just knew that Amber had never dated a guy named Tiberius. And that's yeah. why he like. <laughs> that's true, probably. Heidi is kind of cute, though. Like, I could get behind that. So, anyway, sorry. Ty, yeah. So we were sitting around on Father's Day, and um, they were all here, and we were all on our phones, try looking up baby names to try to find one. And this was... is before you knew the gender, right? Yes, it was mm -hmm. two weeks before the ultrasound that would decide the gender, and um, and so we were trying to find up out a name that my daughter could live with that he would agree to. <laughs> And really, we were just having fun with it, and we were, like, finding all these really strange, exotic names. And so then, all of a sudden, my daughter got really quiet, where we had all been laughing before. And she said, this one means God has heard me. And for those of you who don't know, they had given my daughter a 2% chance of getting pregnant. Mm. And my son-in-law had gone to a men's retreat and got prayed over by all the men there that they would get pregnant. And six weeks later, she found out she was six weeks pregnant, like to the day. Mm -hmm. So it was really a miracle. And so then she, she said, God has heard me. And then she started to cry. And she said, please, to her husband. She just like looked at him, tears running down her face. If it's a girl, can we name her Eliana? And he said, yes. And at that point, Yay. you probably already knew it was going to be a girl. I when knew. God moves like, like that. Nobody yeah. had to tell me. I didn't need an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. um, it was going to be a girl, and her name is going to be Eliana Marie. Oh, That's so. beautiful. Yeah. I have to say, Tina, I think of it as a name from one of your books, too. Like, I mean, it really, I don't, <laughs> it just kind of fits your yeah. brand. So you can, <laughs> you can tell your granddaughter that she's she fits your brand. So yeah, I'm not a I'm fan of 
Marie, I would have preferred like Uhura or mm. some other Star Trek <laughs> reference in there. I might have to talk to your son-in-law. Marie is my middle name. Oh. And also oh, okay. The Sorry. First name, the first he name didn't of, have it legally changed. <laughs> the first name of Adam's aunt. That was his favorite aunt. He was really close to her. Oh, so. that's Aww. that's perfect. That's wonderful. Yeah. So yeah. I already have a book planned, but I need to wait a few years because I need to know Eliana's personality. But it's going to be called The Princesses of Catania. Mm. And um, their grandma tells them, their grandma, the queen, tells them that they can be anything they want. So they choose to be dragon slayers. And Ooh. so when the dragons come and threaten the kingdom, they are going to go off and slay the dragons. I mm. love that. I love it. That's my um, premise. Piper says, oh, my goodness. Liz said, naming children is so hard. My baby was nameless for a week. Wait, no, no, no. We named your baby back on yeah. April 1st. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. How's little tiger doing? <laughs> my husband's, I think, serious suggestion was Achilles. A, a, a Probably Achilles. Achilles. From... That's a beautiful story, though. Pretty name. And how are you doing, Liz? Uh how like baby, adjusting baby life. tiger. <laughs> Gigi says, beautiful baby story, Tina. Piper says, that's beautiful. I love when names mean something to the family. Yeah. And Piper says, the queen. That's right. That's right. She has a crown, we found out during. Yes. Uh, One day I will wear morning. my crown on the podcast. Yes. Wonderful. All right. Well, I'll do my what's up next. So it's not so much blah, blah, blah from Jamie in a row. Uh, I once again am comparing Stoic quotes to quotes from the Bible. And today I have a quote from Seneca who said, let us meet with bravery, whatever may befall us. Let us never feel a shudder at the thought of being wounded or of being made a prisoner or of poverty or persecution. And I bet you all know which verse, uh, can you guess which verse that immediately sent me to? Lots of people's favorites. Any guesses? We're going to go over to Philippians 4. I know both how to be a base and I know how to <laughs> abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And um, I just think that that is a great message. And then to be thinking about the dragon slayers, like, you mm -hmm. know, just picking up that sword and going at it and just attacking whatever challenges before you. Um, the Stoics like to say, well, I'm not sure which one said it, but uh, Ryan Holiday, who's been somebody big in the Stoicism movement, um, points out all the time, the obstacle is the way and your challenges are really what life is all about. We're not meant to just kind of lay in bed and do nothing. We're meant to go and live. And that means facing challenges because uh, what is life without a purpose and uh, a challenge? So that's my Two cents. And I was going to say, what's up with you, Jennifer? But you are uh, off mic coughing. Sorry about that. Um, what's up with people who are yeah. in the chat? If you put your uh, what's up in the chat, that's awesome. Or you could go over to our Facebook group, the listeners of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, and put your what's up there so we can uh, find out how you've been. I, I do want to know how how is Liz doing? <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm really sorry about that. Wow. Um, it's that time of year for me, I guess, the whole sinus drainage and stuff but okay sorry but i just have to say i was waiting tables as i do and this woman they were talking about they're from michigan and i was like oh michigan fall love it and the one lady's like oh but my allergies and other people are like your allergies i'm like no it's a thing yeah you know what i mean and like the other people have at the yet. table yeah mm -hmm. the other people at the table wanted to kind of like push and i was like no it's like i don't know mold or something and people who have allergies mm -hmm. kind of suffer so sorry about that yeah because everybody assumes it only in the spring because of pollen and like that but yeah I think my fall allergies are worse than my, so, but so I, first of all, I want to apologize that we were a couple minutes late, but I just want to tell you it was because we were all excitedly got wrapped up in talking about like the future of the podcast and fun, like big idea plans that we would love to see happen. And we kind of lost track of time. And that brings me around to the fact that we are on today. This is episode 192, which means we are only eight episodes away from our 200th episode like what 200 <laughs> episodes so like that's like 
basically four years that we have been at this and doing this. And it's just crazy to me. So I put a question in our Facebook group asking how we would celebrate. We got lots of congratulations, but I really do want to know what are some ideas? Is there a giveaway that our listeners would like us to do? Is there a special kind of episode that you'd like us to do? Like, would you like Tina to revisit how things are at the nudist colony with her husband? Like, <laughs> You need to go back and watch uh, uh, our April, April Fool's 1st. Day. Yeah, April Fool's <laughs> first day. Um, I'm I don't glad know, you like, said that because I was like, people that on. are listening for the first time are like, I thought this was a Christian podcast. <laughs> just a joke, people. Just a joke. It's a Christian um, nudist colony. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Ridiculousness. But what would our listeners like? Like, what was what is something that you all would like from us? for the 200th episode. Um, You can either comment below here in the comments or um, we would prefer if you would go over to our Facebook group. You can find the link below in the show notes and uh, comment there and let us know, give us some ideas of what to do because we have a little bit of time that we can plan this. So, All righty. So that's your what's up, right, Miss Jen? And Liz responded. She said, my what's up? My days are mostly feeding my baby with a bit of household tasks between. I'm glad my oldest is in kindergarten so I can focus on the new baby. I remember oh, those days. Yeah, I do. Feeding I the baby is work. So like, do not feel guilty to put sit down and prop up those feet. You just go ahead and you just do that. Good yeah. for you. Good for you. Yeah. Sounds like you're adjusting well. And I wonder how the kindergartner feels about the baby also. That's precious. Mm-hmm. You know, the age old advice of sleep when the baby sleeps mm-hmm. is age old advice because it's so true. It's a, there's a reason <laughs> for it. Yeah. Like you need to lay, if, even if you can't sleep, at least put your feet up and rest because it can be exhausting. Mm-hmm. And your body needs that to regenerate energy because feeding a baby takes a lot out of a woman. So especially if you're nursing. <clears throat> right. Piper says there is pollen in the fall too. Grasses and goldenrod and other stuff. Oh, oh Jen, that explains true. it. Shell says 200. Woohoo. Right. Teresa says her what's up is she's getting back into a world she created five years ago. Showed up and wrote a little something every day this week. All right. And sprinted right. to prompt this morning. Ooh, posted in our group. Ooh, yeah. Feels good. Rusty, but good. Oil can, oil can, right? Like to uh-huh. man. Mm-hmm. Piper says, what's up? Pulled all of one storyline into, oh, sorry, put all of one storyline into a Google Doc to try to figure out where it needs help. Other than the ending, I mean, I still don't have that. Piper, I just want to know when that aha moment hits you where you are. <laughs> right. Um, she's been working on this and struggling with like, getting to the end on this one. It's going to be a good one, though, if you work that hard at it, right? So For mm-hmm. sure. Worth the wait, I'm sure. Gigi says, congrats, Liz. So happy for you and your family. Liz says, thanks. And then Piper says, she's so excited to see uh, Teresa in the office hours as well. It's been really um, encouraging and inspiring to see Teresa get back in the saddle. Um, and so if if you're listening now and it's been a while since you wrote anything, go ahead and set 15 minutes and write to our sprint prompt, which we'll visit later. Okay, but for now, we're going to get into the meat of our topic, which is writing groups 101, genre-specific writing groups, pros and cons. So um, we we got talking about this, you know, just as like the the three of us, because like the common advice that you always hear, and we heard it starting out, right, is to find a writing group with other writers in your genre, Right. But as our good friend Becca Syme is always saying, QTP, right? Question the premise. Is that the best advice to be in a writing group that's just your genre? Or should you seek out a writing group that has different writers from different genres? So that's what we decided we're going to talk about today. Yeah. And to be honest, we didn't actually like plan, ooh, let's find a writing group to join that's not genre specific. We've talked a million times about how our writing group came together. The beautiful Rhonda Hagerman um, was kind of the impetus and she didn't even know what we all wrote. She just knew that we were Christian writers and she, she plucked us all and gathered us. And so we, we have daydreamed about this or um, thought about it. And we're going to give you our advice based on just that <laughs> right, you you people have already heard that we feel that really being of the same faith 
is the strongest thing because we don't want to sit there and read anything that got nasty stuff in it. I don't want to critique something like that. Um, and coming from a place of the same, of, of having the same belief system and, and having the same Jesus in our lives helps us with the things that are beyond just the writing, right? The parts of being an author that we struggle with as well. Uh, we have each other to lean on for that too. So, and it makes the critique uh, feel safer. Yes. Somehow. Yeah. So um, we we talked about that, but you've got to admit, Jen, especially, I would think, just because of what you write, that sometimes you're thinking there might be advantages. Like if mm -hmm. I had a group that was just all romance, um, how yes. would that help me or how would that be better or what would be advantages? And so we're going to talk about that first. What are some advantages of having a genre specific writing group? Right. Well, if you're in a genre specific writing group, first of all, the group members are going to understand the newest nuances, nuances <laughs> of the group, of the genre, excuse me. Um, and that like you might know kind of some of the things that are going to be in other genres. But to be honest, I know there might be dragons and fantasy, but I don't really understand the rules about dragons. And there are definitely rules about things like that in other genres. And I don't understand that. Um, but if I were in um, a genre specific writing group, they would understand romance. The others would understand how the genre works and, um, <clears throat> and the tropes, like all the little things that like maybe would get missed by someone who doesn't write in that genre or read prolifically in that genre, you know, and that's, you know, we've had that issue before with like people questioning things. And then luckily I have one person that reads in that genre in the group and she was able to speak up and say, no, 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 that's how it works. That's, that should be how it is and things like that. Cause they just get it. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll out often... myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll out myself as not a romance reader, but I read Jen's romances. What were you going to say, Tina? Um, I don't often wish that I had somebody a um, little bit more seasoned than I that writes in my genre. Mm -hmm. that I could just bounce ideas off of and say, is, is this what this trope is supposed to be or is it not? And, you know, things like that, that because I'm so new, I, and, and I read a lot in my genre. So I really just go by instinct a lot of times, but there are times that I wish I had, you know, like I had a phone to Brandon Sanderson <laughs> mm -hmm. and I could call him up and go, what do you think about this? <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, so that's one advantage that I could see if I had a writing group of all fantasy writers. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that um, Piper has a good point. She says she doesn't write romance, and she knows there are things called meet cutes and other stuff, but I don't know where they belong or what else is required for people who love romance, right? So, right. Um, <clears throat> so Jen's point. Uh, kind of piggybacks on that. Like you would know if you were in a group of only romance writers that they're all going to have that down. Right. Right. It, and if somebody is experienced in that genre, not only are they going to be able to understand it and not like criticize things that are done correctly, but they're also going to be able to point out things that you've missed or that give you help that like, maybe I don't understand why um, this is my, this piece isn't working and they'll be able to say, because you haven't had this happen, like, ah, where, yes. you know, mm -hmm. because they will know the trope so well, or they'll right. know the, the format of romance so well. So yes, that is another thing. Well, um, Gigi's and got a good point, but we're going to talk about the advantages oh. of, um, uh, multi-genre in just in a, a moment. So we'll go back to it. What Jen? And to speak to what um, Tina said, too, about having someone in your genre, especially someone who's more experienced. The other thing, too, that like, no one ever wants to talk about when they're first writing, but like someone more experienced in your genre can also give you advice like on marketing stuff because right. marketing is like, yes, like you can take courses in advertising and you can, it's pretty much going to be the same for everybody, but there are things specific to like your genre too. I am in a marketing group on Facebook. It's a great uh, group, but it's a, a paid course actually. Um, anyway, um, I get advice from people, but I, when the romance experts come out what, and then the Christian romance experts come out, then it's, it's a, a game changer for me because they really know more than I yeah. do. So it also would help with market because we do talk about that kind of stuff in our writing group too. You yeah. Know? And the industry changes so fast, especially for romance, things like what kind of covers will work, things yeah. like um, what's acceptable on covers, things like copyright issues or fonts or any of yeah. those things that are going to be specific to 
we're just using romance as an example, but same with fantasy. Wouldn't you agree? Did, did you all know that like, so I did a ton of research. You guys know this before I did my books and I did a bunch of market research. And, but did you know that romance covers the, the basically tropes of covers changes about every two years? Oh goodness. I think Christian romance is a little slower than that, but still like the covers of my books are getting outdated. Like I'm probably going to have to rebrand all my covers if I want to continue to sell alongside of the bestsellers. But see, those are things I didn't know. But like, again, having like contact with other people in my same genre has helped me to learn these things. So, And this is where being 200 episodes in is really an advantage because um, you will go back to the episodes where Jen was all excited about her cover and it was completely on brand. Isn't that yeah. amazing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like we've lived through a whole cycle. Um, I'd love to get more into what is popular in a romance genre right now, but that's bunny trailing us. So I'm going to take us right. back to the outline here. So um, what should we, are we ready to switch now for, for what are the advantages of being into a non-genre specific writing group? You think it's a yes. fair time to switch to that? Yes, I agreed. Um, so, I will go ahead, Jen. No, you go ahead. I was going to throw it to Gigi's comment since it uh, popped up there. Her feeling is that writers from other genres can offer you a different perspective that will stretch you. Would you like to speak to that, Jen? Um, yes, I found that obviously for myself that there will be things that you guys would suggest or that you would notice that I maybe didn't notice because um, I want it to be fresh as well. Like you want to follow the tropes and you want to write in a way that Christian uh, romance readers are going to enjoy your book, but you also don't want to be so systematic that it just feels like another book. Right. And so I think sometimes the perspectives I get from, you know, you ladies is um makes it my books more fresh and so mm -hmm. i do appreciate that yeah yeah i like that too um when we were brainstorming we were talking about how uh unfortunately um when you write in the same genre as someone else and especially if you come from like a scarcity mindset and especially mm -hmm. if you're coming to writing with the intention of selling and you're expecting this to be an income from you um, it's possible that you may either subconsciously or not see other people who write in your genre as competition. Yeah. And that's interesting to me. Yeah. Because like you said, a scarcity mindset, like, let me tell you people, there are readers out there. There are readers out there for and every single book. And they don't only read book. one book each. Yes. Like <laughs> you can't keep up no matter how, many, how fast you write, people can read faster than what you're writing your books. And so there are hungry readers out there. There is plenty of space in the sphere of, of books, the book sphere for everybody. But people forget that. And so sometimes I think it's subconscious, honestly, like, the, you know, because I think that like jealousy is one of those things that Satan uses against ourselves, not just against other people, but like within our, to eat up ourselves. And that like, so sometimes the critiquing can come across as either too harsh or too um, like, self-serving because there's something inside of us that like, well, if you're succeeding, does that shine a light on an area where I'm not succeeding? Or does it, if a person is like struggling to get across the finish line in their book and you do, they might be like, yay. But then a part of them is like, Ugh, because they haven't, you know, like, and I think that can happen a little bit within a, a, a multi-genre writing group, but it does happen. I've experienced it in uh, within a specific genre writing group in um, whether people realize that they're doing it or not. And really, okay. if you think about it, it's it's kind of goes hand in hand with this idea of writing in a series being mm -hmm. a better marketing idea because people want more of the same. Mm -hmm. Also, if you like get together with more people who write more of the same of mm -hmm. what you write and you team up, then you can like all appeal to the same readers because when they get done reading your your friend Jenny's book then they're going to want more of the same mm -hmm. and where will they find it well maybe she's featured you in her newsletter right and so they can find more of the <clears throat> same and so it really we we should be cooperating with each other and and like I like the motto of the 20 books to 50k group where they say a rising tide lift, lifts all boats I really love that idea and that if we can be more of the same together, we can reach those readers together. Right. Well, and, and I, um, sorry, what were you going to say, Jen? Nope. Go ahead. 
Um, well, first of all, good morning to Barbara who joined us also, but I also want to speak to this theory of sameness. And I think that this is an advantage of having non-genre specific is that you don't end up with, um, so like the strongest personality in a genre specific writing group might say, oh no, this is the way that all fill in the blank of this kind of genre book should be. And before right. you know it, it's a group of four or five women who are all trying to turn out, you know, pick a name, uh, Susie Q's book. And so then you get a whole bunch of writers trying to write like Susie Q instead of a bunch of writers trying to write like themselves. So like, uh, the, the sameness and the difference are both there, um, right. is what I'm trying to say. It offers They're a little important. bit of both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say something along those lines too, is that when you're in a multi-genre writing group, and they just like, look, I'm going to go back to romance because it's what I know. Uh, and they read my romance and they have questions. Like if I can clear up those questions for them and still keep to the tropes into the genres, I've written a better book. If you read the masters of my genre, like I, I, I I've been compared to uh, Karen Kingsbury, which is like the biggest compliment. I, that I, the two people that I'm, I've been compared to, um, only two authors people compare me to. It was Karen Kingsbury and um, Francine Rivers, which like blew me away. But Karen Kingsbury, uh, anyone can pick up her books, whether you like romance or not, and you can enjoy her books and understand her books. The romance is there, um, but it's it's bigger than that. Do you know what I'm saying? And so mm -hmm. when you have people that don't just read romance, you're and they get and they ask questions and they don't understand something. If you can clear that up in your writing, if you can like take that advice and be like, okay, so. A, re a romance reader is going to get this. However, if I can fix this and make it a better story for this person who doesn't read romance, it's going to be a better story overall, in my opinion. So I oh. agree. And that encourages you to, to ask the questions because as Liz said, some quote unquote dumb questions can be useful since mm -hmm. the answer is just because, and then it causes you to rethink. So yeah, if you, like Jen said, if you can come up with an articulate answer for those quote unquote dumb questions, um, first of all, that or will fix your manuscript so that those, yeah. there's no questions. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, uh, so the only bad question is a question you don't ask. Right. right exactly. And that's where it, at the end of the day, um, whether your writing group is genre specific or not, you need to trust the people that you're in the writing group with. And it needs to be a good vibe for you. And do not be afraid to take your manuscript and run far, far away from a group that you don't feel safe enough to ask a question because they want to make you feel small because you, I mean, your intention should be to make the manuscript better. And that's where the questions should come from. Um, mm -hmm. Especially if someone is saying, I think there's something wrong and I just don't know. If you don't ask that question, you never know if that would be the secret to unlocking the key for that person. How many times have we had to give a tough critique to one of the other in the group and we kind of like were nervous about it and felt bad. And then afterwards, after they came out of isolation, they're like, thank you. Mm -hmm. I did. I could, I was too close to the story and I couldn't see the problem and you found it. Mm -hmm. Right. And then like, I can't think of a single time. Well, there probably were times that we, that we were given rough, rough critiques and it just hurt. Like it wasn't a good situation, but most of the time the rough critiques we are that it is a problem and we just can't see it we're too close so yeah. or it's something that you suspected or like it was right there like for me mm -hmm. like i knew there was something wrong but i couldn't quite pinpoint exactly but i was thinking along the lines and then you guys came out and articulated it in a way that solidified it in my mind and yes. i was like yes and yes. another thing that i've experienced for instance you you write romance mm -hmm. and i don't but i have romance in my book Mm -hmm. And so th there's been times where you've made a comment about something <laughs> that I said that either sounded like it was romance when I didn't mean it to, mm -hmm. or where my romance was like not quite hitting the mark. Yes. And that's helped me. It's because I don't really read romance and I don't write it. Like I don't, I don't see those nuances, but you do. And mm -hmm. so then they're very obvious to you and you can comment on it in your critique. So well, and then that brings us to um, what I think is the last point that we want to talk about. And sometimes your seemingly dumb suggestion can become a really great plot twist. Like, yeah. you know, Tina might say, oh, and then she has a pet dragon. And you're like, no, I am totally in like a real world. But then 
later, as you're going about your day, you realize that you didn't know what you wanted the dream that your character was having in chapter four to be about. And oh, maybe a dragon does have, there's a dragon in the dream and the dragon is, you know, portending doom or something like that. So right. to just get a different perspective could cause maybe a plot twist, even in your work that you didn't expect. Right. I absolutely so, agree. I think that the last thing, I think we talked a little bit about the attitude of your group and that was the last thing we wanted to talk about. If you, if you choose, choose to be, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. If you choose to be in a multi-genre, like, because obviously we kind of feel, I wouldn't say we feel strongly about this. If you are in a multi, if you are in a genre specific writing group and you love it, fabulous. Cause you can see there are lots of positives to it, but if you end up in a multi-genre writing group, it's not the end of the world. And be, just because the, all the writing other groups out there will tell you that that's not good. It can be good, but there are some things you have to know correctly. Yeah, there are some things exactly. you have to be aware of. Yes. Yeah. Because, um, this one particular experience, you know, um, some sci-fi is really heavy sci-fi, right. Mm, and yes. you may be forced to read, you know, endless pages of like, you know, boosters and, thrusters and rocket fuel and capacity and things like that. And you just, we were like, in a, uh... I'm just going to stop you right now and tell the truth. <laughs> we were in a writing group with one dude that was hard sci-fi and he has been writing the same book for about 15 years and it's up to 800,000 words. He doesn't see a problem with that. Um, and everything he brought was so, it felt like I was reading a manual on how to operate a spaceship. It wasn't anything about relationships. There was no story, no story happening at all. And maybe that's how hard sci-fi is. So my critique was always kind of like the fact that like, there's no story or like what, and he was out, his attitude was always like, you just don't understand the genre. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> which could be true. It really, I think that true, he would but... say that probably because that might be something you would say, because again, he was not able to really give you any help or critique either. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. the same guy that said, what happened to the third sister? There was never a third <laughs> sister. It was 1,500 words about two sisters, and there was never a third sister. And he spent about 15 minutes. I'm not even kidding. He dominated the writing group and spent about 15 minutes talking about the fact that I just stopped talking about the third sister. There never was a third sister. <laughs> the whole rest of the group's like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Which dude. brings up the larger point of like, you have to have an attitude adjustment and a clear expectation from the get go. Okay. Yes. Because that whole situation could have been with an adjustment of attitude um, maybe mollified or, I mean, I don't know if it was a personality thing, but mm -hmm. the point is like, it, it, that's, that's not a group that you want to remain in and we didn't. And so like, um, you, you want to make sure that the attitudes are addressed, yes. be prepared to be educated about somebody else's genre, be prepared for the potentiality that you just don't know that romance is this way or that way. And also be prepared to hear the hard critiques and to let it get through your shell of, but this is my baby, you know, your manuscript and how dare you call it ugly? Because the, the point is it's not a baby. It's a work in progress. It's mm -hmm. clay on a wheel and you're trying to make it the best possible thing that it can be. Um, and so and you in that same let it through. Yeah. And in that same way, because of that, you have to know your own genre. You have to. Yeah. Like we mm -hmm. talked earlier that like it would be advantageous to be in a genre specific writing group because then you could get advice from the people, throw ideas around or whatever, but you could rely on them to understand the genre. If you are in a multi-genre group, you need to know your genre. That will be on your shoulders and your shoulders alone. Because when somebody doesn't understand your genre and tries to correct something that is supposed to be there, uh, you need to be able to defend your decision. Like, um, for example, years ago when we were still doing a Patreon, um, we used to do a Patreon like critique thing once a week. And I was critiquing one of Rhonda's cozy mysteries beginning. I was like, listen, this is, this is not right because we don't know who this is. Um, you're supposed to, you have to meet the main character. Like the people in this beginning aren't even the characters of the story. You don't start a book off with that. You start out the book with the characters and everyone else is like, you've never read a cozy mystery. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> and she, they explained to me how everything like Rhonda explained to me how everything she'd done was, was genre specific. And she, but she knew her genre and she was able to defend herself. And then I was like, okay, great. And so, um, 
like you have to you have to know your genre. So, well, I'm going to say hi to Leah, who's waving. And then I'm going to say, if you don't know what genre your piece is, you have a whole different issue, which is kind of where I was and sometimes still am when I write something. And um, so we even talked about how that might possibly be fodder for a podcast, because a lot of times you write a piece and you kind of just don't know where it fits. Um, but then I guess I would throw that back up to the benefits of being in a multiple genre group, because mm -hmm. sometimes it could be a really interesting meeting, just everybody debating what genre is this thing that you yeah. wrote. <laughs> I'd like to point out what Piper said. Um, she says, I have been in secular writing groups. One was fine, but the other definitely felt like it wasn't safe being myself. I wasn't safe being myself. And I had to critique works I didn't want in my brain. I think that is more important than what genre the other authors write in. And so that's, I think this goes along with attitude. Like we all have the same values. Mm -hmm. We might not all write Christian fiction per se, but we all have those values. And so we know that when we critique each other, we're going to do it with Christian love and we're going to, um, those values are going to come into play. And so that's one of the reasons we feel safe. And I know you guys aren't going to write stuff that I don't want in my brain. Well, I think that's a really great way to end like the content portion of this podcast. Don't you guys all agree? Or do you have something? Yes, uh, all right. If you have more questions or have more comments that you'd like to make on this, we'd like to continue the conversation over at our Facebook group. Again, the link is below in the show notes. Um, but um, yeah, we keep talking about this and talking about this, but we are here to support you. And we actually have been talking about different ways that we can help support you find writing groups and do writing groups. So stay tuned for that as well, because we have some things cooking in the background. Yes. yes. It's simmering low and slow, like a good Sunday sauce. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Red sauce. Mm. Oh man. Why is this always before lunch? Cause oh. I never eat breakfast before the podcast and then I'm hungry the whole time. And it just takes nothing for me to start thinking about food. Well, maybe I can get your mind off of it by, uh, well, we're going to feed backs instead of oh. feeding our mouths. <laughs> we're going to give each other only positive. Oh, Jason's in the chat. Hey, Jason. Hey, Jason. Long time no see. So um, we're going to give each other positive feedback only. Why? Well, because these are pieces we wrote literally just before we went live on the podcast. We set a timer for 15 minutes every week and we just write, write, write for that 15 minutes. And then we bring those pieces to you all unpolished, unedited, and we share with you what we did in just 15 minutes. And I encourage all of you to participate in this exercise yourselves. Um, we did mention earlier that Teresa had done so. And good for you, Teresa, because guess what you wrote today? And that's what you can say every Friday. I wrote today, you know, because you are a writer. So why not write? Also, it would give you something to potentially put on your website to let people know what your voice is and, and what that process is like. And so without further ado, Jen, why don't you share with us what the prompt is and what you wrote today? So it was a second Friday. So second Fridays are always sentences for us. Um, and it was in quotes, which means you have to use it. You know, have to being, you know, a loose term, I guess, around here, but have to use it. <laughs> and I did. But the sentence was, she could hear him in the shower singing with a joy she hoped he'd retained after she delivered the news. Now, keep in mind, I've been writing in the Widows of the West series for my sprinting and there are no showers there. So I left the Widows of the West behind this week and I just did a little short. It's a short story beginning to end. It ends. Nice. It has an end. It's not as good as Jamie doesn't wrap them up, but I enjoyed it. Okay. She could hear him in the shower singing with a joy. She hoped he'd retained. He'd retain after she. Oh, I read this wrong. What? I thought it was that she hoped that she, he had it after like she'd already delivered the news. Okay. Oh, so no, read it. Read it however okay. you you thought it. Yeah. All right. She could hear him in the shower singing with a joy she'd she hoped he'd retained after she delivered the news. She'd been happy when she'd gotten the call, but Roger had been ecstatic. And now, a full 30 minutes later, he seemed to still be riding the wave of joy. Lovely day. Lovely day. <laughs> lovely day. Lovely day. Roger crooned with a spirit Bill Withers would be hard-pressed to compete with. Darlene knocked on the door. Don't you think you're getting a little overexcited? Roger laughed over the flow of the shower head. The sun has never shined brighter. Rolling her eyes so hard, she was certain he could actually hear the action. She opened the door and stuck her head into the steamy fog. 
Seriously, hon, it was just one holiday. We would have survived. Yeah, but now we don't have to. Instead of surviving, we'll be thriving this Christmas. Roger continued his assault of Lovely Day, butchering not only the notes, but the lyrics of the verses as well. Before Darlene could tell him so, her cell phone rang. She answered it. Hi, Mom. Yeah, we're disappointed you aren't coming for Christmas as well. Another loud laugh echoed inside the shower mm-hmm. stall, and Darlene hoped it hadn't been loud enough for the phone to pick it up. What's that? She continued. No, we don't have plans. Well, not yet. Plans? Roger called from over the shower. <laughs> What's she talking about? <laughs> sure, Mom, that makes sense. You know, since Christmas didn't work out. Don't ruin this for me, Dar, Roger growled. Okay, we'll see you then. She hung, hung up the phone. The shower turned off and Roger's dripping head stuck out from the open shower door. No, not Christmas. No, Darlene said. New Year's. Your mother is coming for New Year's? No, dear. Oh, thank goodness. Darlene smiled slyly, knowing her husband's singing was at an end. We're going to her house. Three, Yay! Two, one. <laughs> so That's many great. good details. The steamy room. Like, so you put enough description in there, just enough to where it was not overpowering, but it did the job. And I love how he's singing. And I loved hearing you sing in your oh. piece. <laughs> Uh, thanks <laughs> Piper says she's laughing and Jen oh that is too funny <laughs> yeah I, I was so um, enjoying the story that I forgot that I was supposed to be finding something to say Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that's what I'm going to say I really enjoyed the story and I love this Roger guy <laughs> and um I don't think he should have to go to his mother-in-law's for New Year's. That's my vote. <laughs> I know. So what what kind of inspired this? Did it just pop into your head, Jen? Because I, I know you I didn't write- want it to be anything about. See, I read the sentence wrong and thought like she'd already given him news and he was so happy about it. So I didn't want it to be about pregnancy or anything like that. You know, like I figured that yeah. was the road that everyone would go down or would be easy to go down. So I'm like, okay, what could he be super excited about that wasn't you know pregnancy? And I'm like that's just came up with that. So I don't know. <laughs> it's not anything autobiographical. My husband loved my mom, like, and I'm pretty sure she loved him more than she loved me. Like it was like, they had that kind of relationship. So it wasn't like that, but I don't know. It's just, it felt it's like also, it was it's a great trope. The mother-in-law trope is a great one. It, yeah. it's, a, it's nice to kick that dog every time you walk past it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My son-in-law loves me. Like they came over while I was gone and he didn't realize I was going to be gone. And he's like, wait, no, I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Piper says it was so fun. She especially loved your singing. Aww. Shell said, fun scene, Jen. Great description. Jason said, I like the details that you added to help us picture the room. LOL. Yeah, that steamy room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gigi said, great. The song was perfect. That is oh, a great okay. song also. I feel like I need to listen to it when I get out of here. Uh, Teresa says, don't ruin this for me. That was my favorite <laughs> line too. Like I, when I started writing it, that line popped into my head and I kept trying. I'm like, please let me get to it before the buzzer goes off. Please let me get to it before the buzzer gets off, goes off. So. Oh, it's great. All right. Good job, Jen. Is your back well fed? It is very well fed. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Yes, I love Fridays. I love them. Okay, so I will go next. So it's not too much Jamie Yakadak and all in a row. Um, Again, the sprint prompt is she could hear him in the shower singing with a joy she hoped he'd retained after she delivered the news. And um, because I just uh, my idea is okay. whatever. Maybe you can spot the prompt in my story. How about that? So you didn't actually use the quote? No. Shocker. Okay. (laughs) I know, right? Right. (laughs) But I wrote today. All right. Exactly. Yes. Yes. All right. So here we go. Let's go, I said, scooping up the remaining kitten and heading for the barn. I didn't have to turn to see if Lorelai was following me. The first few fat drops of rain had made short work of quenching the previously dusty day, and Mm -hmm. I could hear her feet squick through the mud in double time in a fruitless effort to keep up. She called my name, but I was a woman on a mission. If Pa saw the cats, he'd take them to the river like he'd done the last batch, and I couldn't do that to old puss, not again. We get to the barn, 
We got to the barn and I whirled to see Lorelai had also made it, though the two cats she'd banished to tote along hung pitifully from her folded elbows, one dangling by his neck, the other clutched just beneath his forelegs, both wide-eyed and stupid, stunned into silence. I grabbed the one she had by the neck and tucked it into my hoisted dress with the others, then admonished Lorelai to get better hold than the other. She complied, and the dumb thing immediately started complaining and squirming. So I grabbed this one, too, by the scruff, like a mama cat, and gestured up the ladder with it. Get on up there, I said, and she scampered up the ladder just as she had done a million times before. I used my elbows to keep me from getting up, to keep help me get up the first few steps, then started handing the kittens, scruff held one up first, to my sister. She took them from me with amazing speed, and I wondered what she was doing with them, and tried not to imagine her simply flinging them into the hay, though I reckoned to toss into the heap of bristles wouldn't do him any less harm than a plunk into the river. All the kittens gone, I made myself the rest of the way up the ladder just in time. Pa's voice came floating up to us in the loft from just outside the barn. Hooray! He whooped, and I locked eyes with my sister. Had he been into the hooch? Would he call for us? <laughs> I went to the wall and pressed my face against the place where the boards gapped. There was Pa, swinging a jug and laughing. It's a good rain, a good one. He took a big drink from the jug, then started doing a little jig, making a joke about corn flour and the dance her people had done, and singing with a joy I hope he'd retained once he found out about the kittens. Mm, I turned to assess good. them, wondering if one could tell a good mouser at their age. They were mostly huddled together, but a couple scampered. I sighed. We'll need to fetch Mama Cat, Lorelai said, the warble of worry in her voice unmistakable. She'll find us, I said. Then their little ones will call to her when, she, when they's hungry. A crack of thunder made us both jump, and Papa let out another whoop. Though the storm had done nothing to alleviate the stifling heat, I found myself shivering. Three, two, one. So good, Jamie. From the, like description of the big fat raindrops making it into mud and them slopping through it to the very end like just your descriptions are so great and your characters are alive so well done Thanks. i like the word squicking squicking through the mud like that yeah. was so descriptive and i and i love that i had already pictured this little toddler holding the kittens that way <laughs> you said it yes. like, i was like yeah that's how it would happen like yeah it was exactly right yeah it was really good really good <laughs> Piper says, oh no don't let pa take the kitties to the river i and, know and then she said try not to picture her flinging them in the hay i know that was so great honestly like because <laughs> kittens are going to survive let's be honest uh, we've all like you know yeah liz says the image of potential flying kittens yeah. <laughs> i love how you do the dialogue jamie you can tell right away how and where they live yes thanks and Leah agrees. She says the setting, the characters, and every detail crackles. Yes, that's a great. That's oh, a great thanks, crackles. Leah. I love it. I it's love alive. Friday. <laughs> yeah, it's alive. That whole story was alive. And like, yeah, love it. Shell says, wow, Jamie, every word is so well placed. Yes, Tina, love squicking. It felt so real. And Gigi Thank says, you. Jamie, what an awesome story. Your characters are so lovable, scurrying right about to save the kittens. Jason says, I love that word also, Tina. Yeah. Thank you. And if y'all are curious to watch me create that piece, I did remember to go live today. Mm -hmm. So you can go and see me create that piece before your eyes if you want to um, over on our YouTube channel. So um, thanks a lot. for. I love Friday. I love the positive feedback. And now it's time to give some to Miss Christina Katain. First of all, were you able to use the prompt? Well, <laughs> No, I would have known that I used it today, <laughs> full on. I didn't use it as one sentence. Let's put it that way. Oh, okay. So I think it's all in there. Uh, maybe not in so many words. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm what I'm not happy about is having to follow you two. So <laughs> here goes. And I also don't have showers in my world, so I just made a world up. Okay. Oh, okay. Rebecca wiped her sweaty palms on her jeans to little effect. Her heart was racing and her chest felt tight. She paced across the floor, the soft silkiness of the Persian rug cool against her bare feet. At least her feet weren't sweaty, she thought Raleigh to herself. The water from the upstairs shower made gurgling sounds in the pipes behind the walls of the old farmhouse they'd rented. And the sound of Bryson's voice carried down the heating ducts, echoing like a choir in a cathedral. Mm. There was so much joy in his voice. 
Fixing up this old place to its former glory and using it to showcase his talents was the linchpin of his plan to start his own business. How many times had he complained about having to work under bosses that underestimated his abilities or couldn't make sound business decisions? How many times had he stared wistfully into the distance and vocalized his dreams of having his own business one day? Rebecca had just landed the perfect job that would allow him to do just that. Shift manager at the plastics factory wasn't the glamorous career most people dreamed of, but it was perfect for Rebecca and played to all her strengths. She was good at it, and it made her feel confident and strong, something she wouldn't have in another position. She hadn't even considered the effects of the plastic fumes that hung in the air above all the machines. It hadn't even crossed her mind at all until now. Mm -hmm. Rebecca took a shaky breath at the rumbling as the rumbling in the pipes went silent and the sound of Bryson's voice grew quieter as he went into the bedroom to dress. She sat on the couch, her leg bouncing like a speeding train, then stood up again and resumed her pacing. She kept trying to take a cleansing breath like her therapist had taught her, but it wasn't working. Her stomach rose into her throat and she, as she heard him coming down the old wooden staircase, whistling a joyful tune. She wondered how his mood would survive the next few minutes and the dread death of his dream. He stopped and looked at her for a long minute as he entered the room. What's wrong? he asked, worry and suspicion mingled in the question. She pulled the wand from her pocket, walked up and held it out to him. He took it and, look, took it and looked down at it. I'm assuming this isn't a COVID test, he said. <laughs> Rebecca slowly shook her head. Then he beamed at her, picked her up off the floor and spun her in a circle. She gasped. He put her down quickly. I'm sorry. Did I hurt you, he asked, placing his hand on her abdomen, a concerned look on his face. She shook her head again. His grin returned, and he turned, calling back to her as he ran toward the kitchen. I've got to call my mom. Three, two, one. That's such a sweet story. I love it. What a nice ending. Yes. I don't know why you were worried about following us. Oh, that was very sweet. I love the way you didn't say that, that she was pregnant. You just showed us. Tina, you have your writing has come so far since we started as a writing group like i'm just so impressed like you don't ever tell anything like in your sprints like everything is shown and like just so well done what is that mingled with line can you find it worry mingled with something confusion i think worry and suspicion mingled in the question yeah that Mm -hmm. i loved that was Mm -hmm. really good Yeah, Liz said the same thing that I thought. That went the opposite from what I thought. I was expecting her to be sick from the fumes. Me too. I thought it was for sure. Yeah, I was thinking she'd have to quit because she was pregnant. Ah, Piper said she knew it. (laughs) Me and Piper in the same boat were like, yeah, we know this. But I'm so happy that you made him like excited about it instead of like all disappointed. And like this could be such a great book because then like or even a short story because then now they have to move forward in their life and what happens next. And as they struggle together and like which will be struggles in their marriage. And you know what I mean? Like it just and having to rely on God instead of this great job you thought you had. Like eh, it's Mm -hmm. really great. Shell said, so sweet, Tina, master of show, don't tell, which is funny because um, isn't that something you didn't even know about when you joined our writing group all those many months right, ago? Right, it was a weakness, and my learner just went like, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> or my near beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leah uh, Banaki says, so sweet, you always go deep. Go ahead, Jen. Sorry. Piper says, I can imagine her willingness to do what it took to support his dreams and disappointed that she needed to change gears and fear that he wouldn't be happy. And then it's total joy. I agreed. It was so great. Gigi says, oh, Tina, that was great. Was she sick, sad, happy? Yeah, so good. I love yeah. it. I feel like it's a great beginning to um, a, a story that I would read. So Thanks. awesome. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now we got to transition one more time, and this is the what's next. We start our podcast with what's up to catch up with each other, and we end the podcast with what's next. We want to know what's next for you all with your writing careers, or just what are you going to do between now and next Friday? And it's a great time to set a goal. If you want to set a goal that by next Friday, for example, you're going to write 400 words or something like that. Uh, Why don't you make it public to keep yourself accountable? Head over to our Facebook group and type in your what's next. But Tina, what's yours? What's your what's next? Well, um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but my background's a little bit different. I um, redid the office just wasn't working for me. 
my husband's desk was in here and his bookcase and all his books. And I just kept feeling like kind of squeezed. And I tried to put up some screens to block the, the clutter on his side because, you know, he's a pastor. So he just pulls all these books out when he's preparing for a sermon and leaves them stacked in a stack. And th then the next week there's a new stack. <laughs> so it was just, it was um, affecting my creativity a little bit. So because I would be like out in another, another room and I have this idea and I'd come in here to sit down and write and it was a struggle. Mm. So I moved his desk out of here. I moved his bookcases out of here into our room. And I took the spare bed that was in our room and brought it in here. Um, That's where my granddaughter sleeps when she's here. Plus she's five. It's about time for her not to be in the room with us. Um, so I turned my desk and I had neglected my Kanban board and all of my, like, plan my planner and all that because of I just didn't want to be in this room. So I... Like the quarter starts September 27th, but I just did all my fourth quarter planning early and I added those days into the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. And so now I have my Kanban board set up and um, I'm going to work the plan. So all right, I'm feeling yeah. good about, I spent the last two days working in here on my, on my book and I got a lot of progress done. Um, I was getting stuff done, but it just wasn't, flowing like I wanted to. And now I feel like it's flowing again. Well, that's awesome. So you have a goal to just kind of work every day or what are you thinking? What's your plan? Well, I, I have, um, I've been doing a lot of, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? I've been getting a lot of coaching for the, um, the strengths for writers thing. And, um, so I've realized that I'm what they call a Phoenix and a phoenix is somebody that can't just write every day. They kind of have to, like, we write in spurts and then we kind of burn out and then we rise from the ashes kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I've actually scheduled myself in a way that works to that. So, like, I have several days of the week where I'm writing and then I put one day aside for marketing and like my newsletter and that kind of stuff. And then I have a day that I'm not doing any writing, actually two days. Um, so, um, I'm going to see how that works. That's awesome. All right. Great. Um, again, share your what's next in our Facebook group or in the chat here. Uh, we have Leah's what's next. She's still working on her work in progress. She's at 112,000 words. Holy cow. Uh, she's going forward. Progress has been touch and go. She's hoping to get the first draft done. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Piper said, I tried so hard to do the Kanban thing. My ADHD just wouldn't let me stick to any one sort of organizational method for very long. Well, know thyself, right? Right. Um, QTP for you. Because it's funny because, Tina, just as you were saying, like, I'm not the kind of person who can write every day. I was thinking to myself, what would be a really good goal for me to have would be to write every day. I mean, obviously, in 20 minutes, I can churn out a piece of short fiction, but I can just go back to, because there was a very long period of time where I did write every day. My goal was 250 words. And I think if I just um, told myself I would write something every day, even if it wasn't a certain word count, I guess by next Friday, I want to have some kind of a writing goal. And the reason why I'm being so hedgy about this is because <laughs> I'm in school right now. I'm taking a Java development course and it's been feeling like a light week for me. So I feel all brave to say, oh, I could do writing stuff. But seriously, the part of my brain that feels like doing any work at all is just so milked by the end of the day that, but maybe it's a, a good time to be doing a little bit of writing because then it won't feel like work. It'll just feel like I'm going to do this as for me right? Mm -hmm. um, knowing very well, nobody will ever see it. It's not for publication, but it's just to keep the the rust from settling in, as Teresa mentioned earlier. And because I know it made me a better writer, I'm sure it was half a million words by the, by the end of the time that I stopped writing every day. And I know for a fact, it's made me a better writer. So I don't see why I shouldn't try to get back to that. So um, I'm setting myself a soft goal to write every day, Monday through Friday, and we'll check in and see how I do next Friday. 
um, and, and see if I can't bring writing back into my life as the hobby that it needs to be for me, because the pressure of making it be something that earns me a day-to-day -day paycheck is just not something I want to take on, you know? Right. What about for you, Jen? What's, what's uh, next for you? Well, I'm still working through edits on book four. I'm going to continue to do that. Um, I, as well, I've been thinking about trying to re, um, establish my Kanban board, um, and try to do that, but I've been working a lot of, on, um, marketing aspects. Um, I've been doing a lot of, uh, working on my ads, my Amazon ads, and, um, been considering getting my feet wet in Facebook ads as well. But I also been spending a lot of time, like really like planning and thinking and dreaming for the podcast. Cause that's a part of marketing for us as well. Because like we mentioned earlier, you lift one, we all rise, right? And this podcast is a ministry for us to try to help others. And I feel like when we help others, it helps ourselves as well. And so I've got a lot of like, I feel like I'm spinning a lot of plates mentally. Um, but for, so for this next week, the plan is just continue editing and, um, like really try to like come up with some, like write down some things uh, that I'm, um, I've been like kind of working through and, and brainstorming for the podcast. Again, if you have any ideas for our 200th episode, go to our Facebook group and put it in there. So yeah, because we have a few weeks to get it figured out, but a few weeks will go by faster than you realize. I remember yeah. when I was doing um, American Heritage Girls with my uh, daughters, we would start to talk to the Christmas party planning committee around this time of year. And they'd yeah. be like, but that's in December. And I'm like, you don't understand how fast the right. time goes, especially when school starts kicking in and Jen, I think it's interesting because as I am like you in this way that like with, with life starting to be a little more structured, like, well, now it's school time. You start to be like the productivity and how can mm -hmm. I move forward in every way? It's like summer vacation is over and now we are like setting a course for a prosperous yeah. year. Right. And so, yes. um, I totally feel that vibe with the seasons changing and with the back to school stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm riding that wave with you. We have um, a couple Jay more. What's next? Yeah. Yep. Jason says, what's next? Working on fixing a few plot holes in my work in progress next week. I also start a few of my classes. Well, good luck with that one, Jason. Um, plot holes. We all have them, but it's a good thing <laughs> to work through. Teresa, Teresa says, what's next? Read, read through the book I wrote in 2017. Keep writing at least a little bit every day with the goal of writing book two during nano. Oh, oh yeah. Coming. Nano's coming. Our 200th oh. episode will be the first Friday of nano. So keep that in mind when you guys are making suggestions, maybe we would do something nano related for that episode that you guys would like. So. Right. And don't forget that total shenanigans is an option. Total shenanigans <laughs> is an option. A Q and a session could be an option where you can ask us anything. Uh, the late, uh, not labor day. Uh, April 1st was, a, we ask you anything like we like tried to turn the tables on that. And so, yeah. So, all um, right. So I think that wraps it up for this week. So that concludes this episode of the Christian Indie Writers podcast. Until next time, may your pen be prolific, your deadlines be met, and may all of your words honor Christ. Bye now. Bye everyone.